Um, let's just start. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ehsan Nabavi, and I'm a lecturer here at the Australian National Center for Public Awareness of Science, CPAS, at the Australian National University. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon uh, for our Responsible Innovator Lecture Series. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the normal and Namri people on whose lands we meet for this lecture. I'm delighted to um, welcome our distinguished speaker, Professor Anil Gupta, who uh, will be talking about grassroots innovation today. And um, the topic, of course, is very interesting, fascinating, and but unfortunately, we haven't yet explored this topic in our lecture series, uh, which I believe is a critical uh, part of imagining a responsible and sustainable future. Um, there is always um, this great potential in um, our local and indigenous communities, um, or generally speaking, the marginalized communities uh, and sections in our societies that are often undervalued or underexplored um, when we think about the future. And so how we could use this energy, um, how could we use this power uh, is the question uh, that is worth exploring. And today uh, we have this great opportunity uh, to learn about grassroots innovation from Professor Anil Gupta, who has worked um, with, with, on this topic with his colleagues um, in the Honeybee Network for more than 35 years uh, to bring change in this domain. Um, so Professor Anil Gupta is a founder uh, of the Honeybee Network. He retired as a full-time pro, full professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, in 2017, where he served for more than 36 years he held an executive a vice chair at the National Innovation Foundation. He's also a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, before I hand over to Anil, um, as always, um, a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, this lecture will be recorded and the recording will be available on Responsible Innovation Lab uh, website. It is um, innovateresponsibly.org. Uh, so if you want to um, watch the previous recordings, you can go and watch the previous recordings. Um, and um, if you want to share it with your network and colleagues, please do it uh, after this uh, talk. There is an opportunity, like always, for Q&A session. Um, so if you have any question from Anil, please uh, type your question using the chat box. Um, and when it comes to Q&A session, of course, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, without further ado, I want to um, hand over to you, Anil, um, so you can share your screen and uh, talk about um, the grassroots innovation. You are on mute, uh, Anil. Thank you, Asan. It's a great privilege to be with the responsible innovation community around the world, which has engaged itself with making the innovation system, innovation ecosystem, and also innovation actors more responsible towards the environment, towards customers, towards manufacturers, towards uh, various stakeholders. But one of the critical stakeholders who has remained, to my mind, less discussed in the literature and in the arguments on making this, the innovation system responsible are the innovators themselves. And it is for some strange reason that we have liked, we have wanted the corporations to become responsible. But when you look at the products which are there on the shelf, you hardly find a product which will highlight, acknowledge, or showcase the inventor of that product or inventors of that product on the label of that product. Now, what do you lose by doing that? You gain something. You gain something by saying that, look, we celebrate creativity. And I will spend a few minutes today about David Unicorn's story from Australia, which I learned many years ago when I came for a meeting to Australia uh, on the indigenous communities and how they can develop 
uh, their own intellectual property right systems. And at that time, when in, during the tea session, somebody, a native co colleague informed to me about the examples of outstanding achievers, his name came on the top. And yet, as we will see today, uh, there are uh, there are still uh, uh, black spots when it comes to our memory of innovations because uh, when I was going through a film on the net today morning, I found a lot of comments by Australians saying, oh, it's a shame that I didn't know about him. It's a shame that I was not taught about him in my school. It is a shame that it is taking me so long to discover his contribution. So it seems that this problem of ignoring the creative people and achievers of our own society is not just restricted to a developing country, it is universal. And I will show many examples as to how your network, I mean, and I consider myself as a part of this network now. So how the Responsible Innovation Network can redefine the contours of responsibility of academics, of policymakers, of institution builders, so that we do not repeat the acts of commission and omission in the past. So let me uh, take you further and see how we can transcend the limits of our inclusive imagination. And in inclusivity, I will talk about inclusivity of gender, inclusivity of environment, inclusivity of remoteness, the regions which are bypassed, inclusivity of identities, the indigenous people, uh, the blacks and many other minorities who have uh, somehow not received their due and how can then we reciprocate so that's my concern today and i will show you that by changing the context of the current uh, dialogue on the subject of responsible innovations we can make it more rich and bring more uh, density in our discourse so this is the honeybee network as you can see on the logo a nameless, faceless person comes in contact with the network and gets an identity. That's what Honeybee Network stands for. It gives voice, visibility, and velocity. Voice, visibility, and velocity to the creative and innovative people, both in formal and informal sector. We try that our society becomes more conscious of the contribution that creative people make and become more responsible in uh, appreciating their contribution. And how do we do that? So first of course, the goal is that we should recognize, respect, and reward learning from common people. There, there can be different instruments. And the first instrument is, let us acknowledge the contribution of these creative people in our work. And when we acknowledge that, we should also make sure that we do not ex extract rent from this knowledge. Instead, we share, we not only acknowledge an attribute, but we also share the benefits with the local communities in a fair and just manner. We should share the findings of our research in local language and easily understandable manner. And we should connect creative people among themselves because we get connected globally, but many times the people remain isolated. Now, when it comes to uh, acknowledging, you know, many times the guides of the PhD students would give a certificate saying all acknowledgements due have been made. But people still remain anonymous. They become people somewhere nameless, faceless. And I think it is this practice must change. The rule should be attribute and acknowledge unless requested otherwise. Today, the rule is make them anonymous. Don't acknowledge them, mask their identity as if once they are known, some great harm will occur to them. If they want not to be known, that's their wish. But we must follow the default rule. All science and research councils of the country or the world must make change the rules of engagement with the communities in this regard. It should become obligatory that when we collect data from the people, they must get back not only the findings of our research, but also what have we done with the data? What have we used it for? Did we generate any consultancy or per diem or honorarium out of it? And if, if so, did, it, did we share a part of it with those whose knowledge made us rich or made us privileged? Now, these are not very difficult to follow principles. 
But yes, these have not yet become part of the responsible innovation system, but hopefully they will, hopefully they will. And we are hoping that we will be able to encourage our colleagues to pursue what we call as learning walks. Now there are four teachers from whom we learn during this walk when we scout grassroots innovations. And uh, we will, I'll give you some examples, but more importantly, the solutions that people have developed on their own. So there are four teachers from whom we learn uh, every summer, every winter, and also in autumn. Uh, teacher within, the one which is inside us, which asks all kinds of difficult questions. Teacher around in the peers, among the peers. Teacher in the nature and teacher among the common people. People who have solved problems, sometimes complex problems, which large corporations and public systems and R&D labs could not solve. And there are a large number of such examples. Herbal pesticides, veterinary medicine, machines, using, uh, I will give you example, using windmill for pumping water to irrigate the field, irrigate the paddy field. And when you look at why would somebody use a bamboo windmill to use to pump water? Because that um, method of Sain and Mushtaq Ahmed from Assam, northeast of our country, they realized two things that we scientists ignore. One, that it is not important whether you irrigate the field in four hours or 40 hours. In fact, slow irrigation is more sustainable. Plants need moisture, not water for absorbing, for uptaking the nutrients. So there's no rush to irrigate. Why use high horsepower motor, which many poor people can't afford even, and then irrigate it fast? There will be more leaching of nutrients. Second, because hand pump is a single ball system, so there'll be water will coming in spurts. It doesn't matter whether you have uniform flow or uh, interrupted flow or in, or in spurts. So therefore, the principle that emerges from this example of using windmill to run hand pump can be used even in the industrial plants. We sometimes uh, assume that a smoother flow in a boiler, industrial boiler, is better than the flow which is in, which is in spurts. And we don't know, we have not done an experiment, we have just assumed that. It is possible that the efficiency of the chemical reaction might go up if we were to do that differently. So there are lessons that we learn. And there are four levels at which these innovations are diffused, artifactual, analogic or metaphorical, heuristic, and just thought. And just to mention that, uh, just to mention one dimension of the four that many times we don't have to diffuse an innovation from one country to another. We can sometimes diffuse the principles underlying it, the thumb rules underlying it, which may have much wider application. So one of the first principles that emerges from what we're discussing now is that we should reciprocate the generosity of knowledge providers to keep the river of ideas flowing. It will motivate more people and more sharing will take place. Now let's go to the next lesson. This is a very interesting way of uh, recalling the legacy that we have inherited. You know, this is a painting made by our ancestors some 35 to 40,000 years ago. This is from Bimbeteka, which is about 30,000 years ago, Central India. And this teacher is telling us how to make a human figure. And I can get that lesson which he taught 25,000 years ago right as such. He says, make a cross, draw two lines, and then a line for head, head or arm or leg, and you have made a human figure. He is teaching us. And I'm getting the same meaning that this teacher taught 25,000 years ago. So my contention is sharing is in our genes. We have evolved to share. And we must, therefore, I often tell my students sometimes uh, that they should monitor the download to upload ratio. You know, we download a lot of content, we upload much less. But look at these teachers. They uploaded their content on the, these rock paintings 30,000, 40,000 years ago. And we can learn from them about the time of that, at uh, that time, the ornamentation, the kind of uh, hunting expeditions they had, the kind of wildlife that existed at that time. All of that has been imprinted for our learning for such a long time. So this concept of sharing is very important and we must therefore recognize. Now there are 
four kinds of relationship between reciprocity and responsibility. And this is very critical for us to go further as far as the theoretical discussion is concerned. So you can have high reciprocity, low responsibility. So let's say we have made our databases, large number of databases, and some of these have open source content. All of these are open source, no password required. But we may not have experimentally validated each practice. Similarly, people who shared the knowledge may have not used all the practices themselves. So therefore, reciprocity is high. We are sharing very much, but we are not taking responsibility that every information is exact and accurate. We are saying this is best to our knowledge. If it triggers imagination, your imagination, and you can then develop some more solutions, please do that. Second is high reciprocity and high responsibility, which is an ideal case where we take the voucher, the accuracy and, and reliability and validity of every information that we are providing. And so also the people tell us that, look, these are the conditions under which you should perform this. So I was in a committee of uh, uh, US National Academy of uh, Sciences and uh, National Health Institute of US, which was we're having a program on biodiversity conservation through drug discovery. And there was a, a partnership between companies, academic institutions. So Walter Reed Army Malarial Research Institute, scientists were there, or Maurice Ibu from Nigeria was there. And there were several teams and we were a review committee. So I was asking whether there are cases when healer told you some practice and you found it didn't work. They said, yes, it happened once. I said, what happened? Why do, how did you figure out? So we went to the healer. He said, look, you, this is the plant I use for this kind of fever. Why don't you go and give it? And we tried and tried and tried and it didn't show results. So finally, we went to him and exasperated and said, look, it doesn't work. He said, no, how do you give the medicine? He said, we give it by injection. He said, I don't give it by injection. I give it orally. Go back and go give it orally. In other words, sometimes the responsibility is also towards the process, not just product, product, process, purpose and the way it is performing the results. Performance is not an outcome of just the ingredient. It is also an outcome of the sequence of the process. Like in any, any formulation, we have to follow the same scientific accuracy in being responsibly evaluating its efficacy and not using wrong process to evaluate a right practice and blame them that look, it doesn't work. So reciprocity is, in respecting the protocols that communities have developed and testing them through that protocol first. And then you modify the protocol if you wish to for making it more effective. Low reciprocity and high responsibility. Now, this is a case where many academics are very responsible towards their domain, towards their profession. But if you ask them, did you ask your student to share the findings? with the people from whom they collected data and they will then look at left and right and say, well, we didn't really do that. We were in rush. Why, why should that time be saved, which is of reciprocity? Other steps, all other thing, four years, a student spends for doing thesis, but wouldn't spend 40 hours for sharing? How is that fair? How is that right? But the norms of responsibility that profession has evolved do not require such reciprocity. So in that sense, they're responsible within the norms of, the of that domain, of that, of that profession. They are not violating any of the guidelines of the Social Science Research Council because that doesn't, the council doesn't require the reciprocity. And then, then there's a low reciprocity and low responsibility, which is the most widespread case where we take the things, do whatever we wish with it, we don't care whether or not people have been knowledge of it or benefit from it. So these are some ways in which we can evaluate our protocols, our norms of being responsible and then correct it. Now let us look at this case of Unipon. Unipon was uh, an indigenous person, of course. He uh, became a priest. He was a serial inventor. Many people called him the Leonardo da Vinci of Australia and among the indigenous people. He developed a lot of solutions. He also pursued some of the failed mission like perpetual motion motion, but we can ignore that. But the beauty is 
as you saw on the first slide when I had begun, I had shown the machine that he made a straight line reciprocal movement by which the shearing of sheep could become possible. And that changed the destiny of Australia. Now someone who shaped the destiny of a nation must be part of every curriculum of every class in one or the other detail. Every single student, not just in Australia, around the world should know that the indigenous people can solve problems which our more accomplished scholars and labs and companies could not solve and they can change the destiny of a society. Unfortunately, as the study, as the literature shows, as the reviews show, that uh, his legacy is not as well established in our consciousness as it deserves to be. In fact, he talks about in one of his writing about sympathetic cooperation. So what I'm going to talk today actually is something that he talked about 100 years ago, which was a sympathetic cooperation, cooperation between blacks and white, cooperation between indigenous and uh, other immigrants and so on. He basically wanted a sympathetic cooperation. You understand my problems. Look at where from I come and how did I discover this? And I will understand your problem because you have come with a different background and we should both respect and reciprocate. This was the legacy that he built. So that second lesson is that recognizing creativity is good, but making it a part of curriculum on social change, on inclusive development and policies is important. We create a legacy for looking at the minds on the margin, which make a big difference. This is something that must become part of our second nature. This is the indoctrination process of a good citizenship, a responsible citizenship, a citizen who is not going to ignore the minds on the margin, as I have said in my book. And look, at, look at another person, a maverick inventor, and he died in penury because his innovation of amphibious cycle, a tractor, so many things he made. He was a serial inventor, Mr. Saidullah. He was honored by National Innovation Foundation, which I founded in 2000, after Sashti and Gyan were set up in 93 and 97. We gave him Lifetime Achievement Award. But that award or that money wouldn't take him very far. We couldn't create market for amphibious cycle. It could have become a water sport. It could have been very useful for flood prone region. In many parts of the country, world, floods are affecting the nations. And when you have a flood and you have to deliver medicines or milk to the infant, this will be very handy uh, because a boat requires several people to run and manage. This could be very easily managed in even estuaries and other narrow waters. But it did not happen. We failed. So many times we are not able to give the leverage, give the velocity that is required. What do we do in such cases? The third lesson is that, yes, it is important to link, learn, leverage, and legitimize the creative, frugal innovations. But when markets fail, should not be associations, academic associations, responsible innovation network, and public systems intervene. So the role of a state in such cases becomes very important because after all, we are building society. We are building future. We are building, we are shaping the mind. We are formatting the hard disk of our young people. And in that sense, when we are formatting our mind, we must build this capacity and sensitivity that not every innovation will always succeed only through marketplaces. The markets have their own way of evaluating the returns. And just because markets don't pick up doesn't make an idea less useful. So we need to have non-market interventions as much. After all, all of us get privileges because of being in the campus or being in part of academic life. So also the other people should get privileges which they may not necessarily be able to pay for. This is third exam another example that I'm taking. Ganga Bhan, she wrote a book in 1898. We have published this book, republished this book. And she put together 2,080 formulations of self-employment. It is said that 1,000 copies have sold in three days in 1898. She seems to have inspired Gandhi, who talked about self-reliance and, and uh, using the local materials and uh, skills several years later. Does she matter? How many people in my country know about her? 
when the current prime minister and he was at that time chief minister we shared with him this story he did set up a award but that award is still to be rejuvenated it has been lying dormant so the question is how do we maintain the legacy of these people let me give another example i don't know if anybody on the talk today knows the author of the book mothers and daughters of invention as on do you know and i doubt if anybody knows you know is and when i tell you about this book you will be amazed at the systematic indifference and ignorance of the academic world i have gone to mit and harvard and i asked the same question how many of you please raise your hand and not one did i find who had read this book and they were talking about innovations and they were talking about inventions look at this autumn stanley she wrote this book 1995 mothers and daughters of invention notes for a revised history of technology and she writes about how the husband the father and the other males took the credit for the inventions that their spouses their daughters or their sisters made systematically record them she looks at the data of 200 years of us pto us patent and trademark office 200 year data she spent 13 years of her life in analyzing that data and what did she found what did she find she found that till 191809 to 1985 the share of women was 1% in the mecca of innovation usa and later it became 4 to 8% by different estimates what are we talking about such a neglect and then this book is ignored and doesn't become a compulsory reading for every student of innovation everywhere in the world it should be a compulsory reading to show that the women can solve very complex problems you know they can the language computer language is one of the languages important left developed by women and loom jacquard loom and many other innovations were made by them but we did not recognize so the question is now that women are creative they innovate they invent they solve the problems often in the domain that they are allowed but across the domain also sometimes but their contributions are neglected what kind of responsibility it is of the innovation ecosystem which does not recognize the unsung heroines of our system and create sensitivity in us the male dominated society that we must be very sensitive very careful in not masking the contributions of women whether in formal sector or informal sector when it comes to these solving problems what damage would it do nothing it will only make our society more fair more creative more compassionate more collaborative it will not do any harm at all it may hurt the vanity of some male that, that's all but other than that it cannot do any damage and yet these are contributions which have not become part of our uh, consciousness our part of our uh, active agency of our life so we must always distinguish of course between two parts of innovation innovations from and innovation for innovations from grassroots are they come out with lot of difficulty when we filed patents in us three patents in 2003 were granted to three farmers from india all the three farmers from gujarat did not educate were educated beyond 10th class and patents in for example one patent was for a tractor which has three wheel or four wheel you can convert it into three wheel or four wheel depending upon terrain and a motorcycle based plowing machine and then there was another one on cotton stripping machine and so on and these patents were granted to these farmer innovators grassroots innovators in usa that means the prior art of that country was transcended by these innovators otherwise they would not be granted patent so we have got many more patents of that kind more than 1200 in india about eight in usa and many other countries what we are trying also so what i'm saying is that the struggle that innovators from the grassroots level go through is different from innovations for grassroots for example a company or a scholar develops a very low cost water filter that is innovation for grassroots it will be used by the companies and it is dell come and we want it but that's not the same the struggle is not the same as the one who works without workshop so material constraints are not a necessary condition for uh developing grassroots innovations but voluntary suffering is you may not be suffering from material constraint but if you do not suffer voluntarily the pain the people who are suffering from that problem your mind may not be trained to solve problems empathetically 
So frugal solutions require us to suffer voluntarily about the problem. I would like to share now a responsible innovation playground. And there are two dimensions, basically, inside out and outside in. The inside out is, do I want to share my ideas, my knowledge, my toolbox with outsiders? Outside in is, do I want to learn from others? Are there things that I want to learn and absorb in my own uh, value chain or my experiments or my innovation pursuits? When both are low, I'm behaving like an ostrich. I don't want to learn, I don't want to share, doomed. Such, you know, the facet machine, which I used when I was doing my research uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you had to use a calculator and, you know, facet was the leader of the calculators at that time. There were no electronic calculators. For one simultaneous equation, we had to spend a whole night in solving that by moving one by one digit and then optimizing the solution. It disappeared because it didn't learn enough from the market and it didn't notice what was writing on what was emerging in the society. But then that's another interesting case of low inside out, but high outside it. PNG, for example, had hardly 10% of its patent being used when they were realizing that, look, our r and system is not working well. So they started crowdsourcing. And their efficiency went to 50%. Their stock prices went up. The almost 40 to 45% of the products had ideas coming outside the company. All these changes took place. But there was one reciprocity missing. So if you charge, let's say you say you give $10,000 for an idea. Fine. I have received $10,000 for my idea. Our transaction is over. At least tell me that you made $10 million out of it. I'm not asking you for more money. I'm asking you for feedback so that I become more conscious of the worth of my own ideas. Next time, I will feel more proud about my capacity and maybe able to demand better price from you. What's wrong with that? But no, most crowdsourcing institutions, companies, organizations do not share, do not share what they do with those ideas, exceptions apart. So that is a sponge model. The recipro reciprocity is missing. One reciprocity is missing it can become much more reciprocal. This one is low outside in, high inside out. That means you are a leader in the profession, in your company, in your domain, and you want to share a lot. Tesla shared all their battery patents. They put them in open. The electric vehicle private company, why would they keep their, why would they open their patents in a competitive field like battery? Because they wanted more people to manufacture electric cars. So the charging stations can be installed, not just for Tesla, but for other manufacturers also. So you expand the market. And since you are a leader, you will be always ahead. You can always develop better solutions and so on and so forth. So now these are pollinators, people who are leaders and create example, can create benchmarks of sharing. They don't care whether they're getting back enough or what, they, what, what other people will like to take as a price or as a reciprocal behavior. So it's a asymmetric reciprocity. You share but don't care for whether others reciprocate or not. And that only the people with the rich heart can do. But if this, both are high, if both are high, that means I want to learn a lot and I want to share a lot. This is what Honeybee Network does. We have put together recently, for instance, 1 million abandoned US patents in an open database, yarn.org slash patent open database. Anybody can access them. One million abundant patents because every small entrepreneur, every inventor can use this as a building block and benefit from these. They should of course acknowledge them. That's the moral right of the inventor. But the knowledge is now open domain because the person has not renewed those patents. That's the main reason for abandonment. Similarly, we have got 200,000 engineering project database. We have got database on medicinal plant. We have got database on grassroots innovation. All of these are open. So when you share a lot, the advantage is that many people don't know who to write to when they invent some solution. They write to us. So it becomes a very interesting two-way street where people know if there is one person whom we should write, maybe this is the place we should write to. But those, the, the kind of leaders, the kind of organizations that will maintain this framework need to have large heart and big mind. In my language, I call it dil bada, dimag bada. You know, you should have big heart and big mind. Only then 
in fact if your heart is big your mind automatically becomes big that's my experience of life that if you are sharing more which is what requires large heartedness then your mind also grows i will skip this and this is just a small way of how reciprocities can also be by increasing the capacity of the people with whom we work so for example uh, there are two dimensions assurance and capacity sometimes you bridge the need gap sometimes you enhance the need sometimes you eliminate the need for example of child labor and sometimes you transform the need there are different ways in which you reciprocate reciprocate so that is a, we must have a rich taxonomy of reciprocity along with responsibility so that we don't always try to look at everybody getting payment for money in many no that's not the way to reciprocate always sometimes you work with me and solve the problem creatively co-creation that's a that increases my capacity also coming toward the last part of my talk because i think i have got a few more minutes uh, i will use 15 more minutes and then stop the innovations have to be grassroots innovations are often frugal inclusive and sustainable frugality is not only for consumer frugality is not only for manufacturer frugality is also for the mother earth for the planet all the three kinds of frugality must be included and that is where the grassroots innovations score well not all of them some of them there are innovations grassroots innovations which are very bad for the environment for example using dynamite to catch fish it will catch small fish and big fish too it's a grassroots innovations but not sustainable at all so i am not arguing that all grassroots innovations are green or sustainable no most are but not all so we will have to be eclectic about this we should be very judicious about it that just because somebody is poor necessarily would be more concerned about nature or environment no that's not true sometimes people can cut corners they can take shortcuts they can use things which are not sustainable and i gave example of dynamite there are many other cases of this kind there are uh, which which lead to small fish and big fish being captured together and therefore the dynamics of the fish will go down and therefore the sustainability will be affected so we must of course recognize that accessibility affordability and availability all the three are important it is in the availability domain that grassroots innovation suffer because they make only small scale production they are looking at local needs they do not have the logistical support they do not have the supply chain support and most importantly they do not have the venture micro venture fund you know micro finance has become very popular micro finance is for good and services for which market exists micro venture finance is for good and services for which market does not yet exist but there is no micro venture finance anywhere in our country we tried but this experiment is not succeeding so far i have not yet succeeded in persuading the financial institutions of our country to provide micro venture finance on a sustainable basis and we are tried uh, two days back i was in undp the new york when the film was being launched on uh, grassroots innovations and i made a plea with the undp administrator and you know undp act lab network in 115 countries 91 labs we are working closely with them for last two years that you must set up a micro venture fund it is not enough to recognize innovations it is good that they are affordable it is good that they are accessible but they will never become available unless we provide them finance and of course design input and logistical support so it's very important that solutions should be available for people who want to use them easily and that will require supply chain management now when it comes to inclusivity i will not go much more into that but enough to mention that inclusivity of spaces the by the we, we are having uh, some activities in northeast of our country which is bypassed by the market and state jammu kashmir and many other regions of our country which may not have as much, developed as much as other regions have developed so spatial inclusion sectoral inclusion handloom the i'm wearing a handloom kurta now many times this cloth the weavers of this cloth have not had much input from designers or from uh, financial instrument institutions so they remain poor and their uh, technological change has not taken place much the productivity is low so some sectors have been bypassed some seasons flood drought uh, social segments there are there are indigenous people local communities black shrew caste and shrew tribe people in our country have been bypassed 
uh, skills and knowledge of certain kind has been bypassed. And sometimes the rules of governance are such that they built in exclusion by definition, by the, the way rules are designed, they build to exclude them. So Gyan, which was set up in 97 as the first incubator of grassroots innovations to my mind in the world, tries to link these three innovation, investment, enterprise. And I would invite all the members of Responsible Innovation Network to join us in this effort to uh, see how we can make this triangle possible, not just locally and regionally, but globally. So Innovation from India finds an investor in Australia and sets up an enterprise in Namibia. That is what a global outreach of this triangle be that not all the three actors need to be in one country. This is one small example where a herbal cream was made by our lab, six different innovators. All of them were invited by the company when it was launched and they get royalty for 20 years. They will continue to get royalty from the uh, company which used this, their new, pulled their knowledge and developed this herbal cream for skin. So there are examples, for example, one child gave an example, why should there be not a fourth traffic light? Now, if you ask yourself, why should there be fourth light? Nobody has thought about it. But many of us who suffer traffic jams know that if there was a blue light on, we will either take a left turn, right turn or U-turn, but not go forward because we're going to waste one hour. Now, imagine if this creative idea is used by the traffic managers all over the world, it will make the life of the commuters more easy. And a person from a remote place would have influenced the traffic system of the world. That is the power. Can we borrow the charge from your phone? And many times, many times we have that low battery and we haven't thought about, and these kids thought about this. We met them in a show, why can't we borrow credit charge from this? This walker, you know, walkers don't work on the steps. But this girl, she was at that time in eighth class, Shalini, suggested that when you come down, the walk front leg become taller. When you go up, they become shorter. Our National Innovation Foundation made it uh, into a product, licensed to a company, and now it's available in the marketplace. So learning, leveraging, linking, and legitimizing, all the four steps are important in reciprocal and responsible innovation system. I will not take more time just to tell you that Gandhiji in 20, 1929 gave a call when he found that from 20 to 29, he failed in modifying the design of the spinning wheel. He announced the competition with 7,700 pounds, one lakh rupees. Now it must be billions of dollars worth of money. And he got this design by 1931 when he went to jail. He, in Vardha, he was using this spinning wheel, foldable, transportable, easy to manage, easy to maintain. So crowdsourcing was done as long back as 1929. And of course, there are many examples in Europe even before that. So the point is, this is a responsible innovation because he made a condition that if you want award money, you have to make your design open source. That was the condition listed, listed there in the announcement. So. Sometimes challenge awards can be a very powerful way of overcoming inertia in our society. This is the global competition that we have. The last date is September 30th, HBN Kriya. And we found some wonderful innovations last year, uh, a device which will scan the mosquitoes and tell you whether it is harmful mosquito or it is a non-harmful one so that you don't have to use pesticide to kill all mosquitoes. There's no need to. You can only kill those which are harmful. Why do you do that? This was the book where I argued that minds on the margin are not marginal minds. That is our appeal to all of you. Finally, a change not monitored is a change not desired. I have said this from early 80s because if you really want responsible innovation system to be reciprocal also in the process, then ask, look for those examples where we have faltered, where we have missed, and let us try to make them good, make them compensate for the acts of omission and commission in the past and be more responsible in future. Finally, be a bee, honey bee, which cross pollinates and flowers don't complain when their nectar is taken away, they invite them. And of course, it enriches the diversity. Thank you so much. Thank you.